Should we keep on talking till the end or, or maybe we should, uh, you know, we should say, say goodbye. I'll tell you I love you and you had a full life and you can, you can go. It's a feeling of fulfillment. I said, yeah, thank you. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> and we said goodbye. And uh, afterwards she wrote... that they're inside the house and um, yeah I, I I wrote her I'm with you she said I feel you and in at first I said I, I thought to myself what are you empathizing with me for I mean what do you mean you feel me I, I read it as she's sorry for me mm. what but then I, I, <laughs> then I understood that she meant that she feels my presence and that was touching. Welcome to Raw, a podcast where we confront the complexities of war from the inside out. I'm Manouk, a journalist, author, yoga teacher, and meditation practitioner. Raw, or war spelled backwards, symbolizes how many of us feel in the face of the Israel-Gaza conflict, exposed, vulnerable, and seeking understanding. Here, we don't just discuss the external battles, but dive deep into our internal struggles, examining how this violence has shaken our very core. Join me in conversations with philosophers, psychologists, and spiritual leaders as we explore how to navigate these painful times with wisdom and resilience, finding guidance for our own paths through this raw, unfiltered world. On October 6th, Jonathan Zygen was busy living his life as a social worker and father of two in Tel Aviv. He had resigned himself to leaving political activism to his mother, Vivian Silver, a petite but mighty peace activist known for her warm smile and for founding the initiative Women Wage Peace. But on October 7th, Vivian was tragically murdered by Hamas in her kibbutz on the Gaza border, having spent her final hours on the phone with her son. This devastating event stirred something profound in Yonatan, compelling him to step into his mother's shoes. More than ever, he felt the urgent need to continue her fight for peace, even in the midst of overwhelming war. Yonatan, welcome. Thank you for coming into the studio this morning. Uh, Thank you for having me. It's... We were just laughing just a minute ago, but our listeners can get to hear just because this is... typical Israeliness, I said, uh, where do you live in Tel Aviv? And you said Florentine. And then I said, ah, you know, the mix of the kibbutz and Florentine, which is this like hip area of Tel Aviv, is why you came into this interview with torn shorts and, <laughs> and sandals. And I came in with a shirt and pants because I live in North Tel Aviv. <laughs> Different worlds. <laughs> But where are you from originally? <laughs> I'm from Belgium, actually. Ah. And it's, you're the first person to ask me that. And um, I'm sure the listeners will be surprised because most people think I'm American right. and I have actually never lived in the United States. And actually, I did my um, higher education, my university studies in London. So if anything, I should have a British accent. Hmm. But I am married to an American and we've been together for quite a long time. <laughs> and he says I should be a Mossad spy. He still sometimes <laughs> believes maybe I am because in all languages, I speak a few. I have a very local accent. But... Yeah. Um, The Mossad never tried to recruit me, so <laughs> maybe I should be offended. Well, we can't know if that's not the if true If that's the statement. truth or not. Jonathan, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, first of all, it's lovely to see you smile and laugh uh, despite 
the tragic circumstances that made you become someone who comes on to radio shows and gets interviewed. So uh, your mother is um, Vivian Silver. She was murdered on October 7th. Uh, she was known throughout her life for being a, a, a fierce peace activist. And I was looking again this morning at a picture of her And uh, in all these articles, you know, it says she's fierce and fearless and all these things. And and uh, she just has such a lovely aura. I've ne I never met her, but just in her picture, she just looked so <laughs> lovely and petite and <laughs> delicate and just a, such a nice smile. I'm sure she'd just be lovely to absolutely anyone she met. It's interesting that she she became in her death this kind of uh, symbol this idea that different sides are using to make quite extreme points so um, I've heard some people and, and this is terrible saying you know left-wing people like her peace building never worked you know her 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 attempt to reach out her hand didn't save her and then you know you have the the other side which is putting her up as the symbol of what Israel should always have been and, and, and should be but she was to you just a mom just a person and I'm sure in life she wasn't completely fearless or fierce I'm sure she had her own fears and doubts and I'd love to For you to tell me a little bit about um, about Vivian, the person, and also about her final moments in Kibbutz Be'eri. You were on the phone with her. You were the last one to speak with her. Tell us a little bit how, how Vivian, the person, was still there in those final moments. As you pointed out, she had very interesting dualities. In her life, because she was fierce and stubborn and, and driven, and uh, a lot of people didn't want to get into to uh, arguments with her because she was very compelling and assertive. But at the same time, uh, she was so nice and sensitive and uh, very focused on, on relationships, interpersonal relationships. I think that was the base of every interaction she had professionally and, um, and ideologically. It was always based in interpersonal relationships. And I think that's part of the reason why she became so known or appreciated in the world, not only the work she did, but how she did it. And yeah, she was my mother and my brother's mother and the grandmother to our children. And she was very soft at it. <laughs> and I would tease her a lot of times. I would say, how is it that you run so many things? You know, you're a manager and a CEO and, 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 And run initiatives, and and you can't, you know, you can't face me <laughs> at home. We can decide, you know, you have to matter what I thought or what your kids thought, and uh, yeah, it was funny. Tell me about her final moments and your your final exchanges. Um. Well, we were on the phone. For all these hours, those hours, um, I mean, at first I didn't pay it much attention, waking up in Tel Aviv from the alarms. But pretty soon I realized it's something unusual and I called her and um, we were talking. Uh, some on the phone and some via WhatsApp. And uh, up until quite late which was pretty early in in the overall uh, event but uh, I mean she died at 11 a.m. 
So I was with her uh, for a few hours and she, she kept it pretty cool most of the time. And we were, we were joking a lot and trying to figure out what's going on in a calm way. She wasn't hysterical. I remember one conversation I, I talked to her and she, and I heard over the phone, I heard the gunshots and, uh, and yelling outside her window. And I said, okay, what's the protocol? <laughs> what do we do in a situation like this? And she said, um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I said, uh, should we keep on talking till the end? Or, or maybe we should, uh, you know, we should say, say goodbye. I'll tell you I love you. And you had a um, full life and you can, you can go. It's a feeling of fulfillment. I said, yeah, thank you. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> and we said goodbye. And uh, afterwards she wrote that they're inside the house and um, yeah I, I I wrote her I'm with you she said I feel you and in, at first I said I, I thought to myself what are you empathizing with me for I mean what do you mean you feel me I, I read it as she's sorry for me mm. like, what but then I I, <laughs> then I understood that she meant that she feels my presence and that was touching that was the last she wrote you yeah after that you and and most people thought she had been abducted it took i think more than a month um for her remains to be found mm -hmm. how how was that month of thinking she was taken Uh, it was psychotic, really intense time. Um, at first, you know, the first couple of hours, I, I was sure she was dead. And it was very silent in my mind, and I started processing, and I don't know, this tender feeling of loss. And then it became... I don't know, it became very intense in in the feeling that she's not dead because there's nobody, nobody knows anything. People, her neighbors, I already knew about neighbors of hers that were dead. And, um, and we geolocated her phone. It was still in the kibbutz, but it moved. And I, we, it, so we started thinking she was uh, kidnapped. And then the fake news about, or, or misleading news about uh, the hostages in the dining room. So we were sure, I mean, we thought maybe she's one of them. And a day passes and another day, no news, nothing, no information about what happened to the house even, because they were still fighting. Only on Wednesday, my uh, father-in-law was able to go to the house because he works in agriculture in the kibbutz and he only then he told me that the house was burnt down but he didn't find anything mm. so friends of hers told me you should start working campaigning I said what <laughs> what are you talking about I'm waiting no this is a situation of a campaign <laughs> so I started like private task force with uh, with friends of hers, colleagues. And we were working, very intensely working, in terms of media and putting her on the agenda and meetings with uh, the Canadian uh, embassy and staff. She, she's Canadian, she's Canadian, Israeli. And, uh, and together with the um, hostage families, stream of information I um, like it's not real information but you you all the time you're looking for information yeah. and whatsapp groups and and interviews hundreds of interviews so it was very intense and afterwards i felt 
weirdly, I appreciated that period of time where she was dead. She died at 11th on the 7th of October, but for me, she was still alive for more than a month, and I, I carried her with me in a different manner than if I knew she was dead. Mm. It was a unique uh, experience in that sense. But I remember, you know, going to funerals of my community in my community because so many people died in Berry and... Um, And people, you know, a mother burying her son and, and hugging, I am, I'm hugging her and she's, she's sorry for me. I said, what, what? I didn't understand that. I, I still have this hope, you know. She told me, you know, we know how to deal with uh, grief, with loss. That's something we have mechanisms for. But this uncertainty and, and this, you know, limbo of Of the hostages and uh, afterwards I understood afterwards I understood and now I'm I really it's so I'm I, I am kind of grateful that I don't have to be a part of the hostage families now it's just so terrible so going back to to you to your life before you're a social worker living in Tel Aviv you have three young kids um, you walk around wearing tor torn shorts <laughs> <laughs> you have this life and you you say that uh, that you're pretty politically blase you are kind of in a political coma or at least yeah. a kind of form of diminished consciousness and you're just trying to be a good family man and to enjoy your life um, while at the same time telling your mother that you know that Israel is is dead and, and there is there's no future and you're you're disenchanted like many young liberal um, left-leaning people yeah. um, but you're living your life and then you October 7th happens and the death of your mother and at some point you realize um, that you have to take on her mantle um, and you have to carry the torch and you leave your job and you become a full-time activist you travel the world you speak on panels you speak at conferences you meet with international leaders you're part of the um, you sometimes meet with a families forum what you Does that change due to a person and how do you feel about yourself now versus how you felt about yourself before your questions are long and complex <laughs> um, I was always conscious and I was always um, politically fired up but it wasn't synchronized with any doing that's the part I gave up on you being involved and invested in it. So I think that there was a part in my life that felt alienated or alienation in terms of living um, a normal bourgeois life as far as you can be bourgeois as a social worker in Israel <laughs> and thinking that nothing is sustainable. And in that sense, now, sadly, I feel connected in tune between my thoughts and my actions. You know, in the personal sense, there's the question of healing, of what do you do in the face of pain or trauma? Because the feeling in, on October 7th was so helpless. And now I, like, gained this control on my... Uh, fate or on my narrative so there's a healing aspect to it and in terms of the politics of it I I really felt that I have to be involved that you know the before and after effect was so strong I couldn't go back to being uninvolved unwillingly I got this new status of bereavement and And I felt responsible to utilize it in order to create change, in order to try to shape 
the reality around me. You know, all of us, we, we need change. <laughs> we need change in the Middle East uh, between Israel and Palestine. And, uh, and if I am in a position that I have a stage, then I, I really am obligated, obligated to, to, to be involved. War pushes the, the public opinion, it pushes it very uh, to a dark place. If we want the public to express uh, positive uh, ideas, we need positive settings. We need peace. You know, when we, when we get to the point that we make peace with the Palestinians, you'll see polls <laughs> the Palestinians loving Israel and, uh, and, and supporting peace and wanting it. There's Israelis and Palestinians who want peace and there are Israelis and Palestinians who don't want peace. And at the moment, the majority in both peoples are a... Uh, are, uh, engulfed in this um, attitude of war. It's dynamic. It can change in a heartbeat if we have a political vision, if we have um, um, like a prospect of a different setting, settings in the, in the Middle East. Because I meditate and I'm, so, I'm quite aware of what's the thought streams that happen in my own brain, I will notice that depending on what I read and the people that I surround myself with um, and how much I am on social media, particularly for me, my, um, my internal kind of subconscious subliminal messaging will be very, very different. I am willing to be very honest in the fact that sometimes, for example, when I see um, certain kind of propagandist messages showing how they are celebrating in the streets or even like things like I will hear about some politician in Belgium, which is where I'm from, saying some atrocious thing about Jews or, or even about all of Israel, etc. It will kind of suck me back like like a vacuum cleaner into a space of feeling personally threatened and it will make me want to come really close in with my tribe and so suddenly I'm in a place where even the people among my tribe are not so much individuals it doesn't so much matter what they individually think or whether they're kind or or unkind or They're my people, and so I must protect them and they, because I want them to protect me. My psychological f feeling of fragility in the face of the world's verbal or physical or imagined violence. And the other side, whoever is not part of my tribe, will suddenly become much less real. I think it's really important to have a discussion about that as well because... One of the things that happens is that we humanize, dehumanize, humanize, dehumanize. And I think, unfortunately, the majority of, pe majority of people don't think about through no fault of their own, but they don't realize to what extent the circumstances and what surrounds them. And again, what they read and who they speak with and, and how much they want to belong in their community, etc. How much that affects what they think and whether they humanize or dehumanize certain people. I think that uh, the, the fact that we are so fragile in our conscience and that, uh, and that everything is so, you know, on the metronome of, uh, of uh, humanizing, dehumanizing, like you said, we need a people, you know, a small group of people or representatives to be detached and to be above and to have the resources, mental time, place, you know, space to transcend the daily psychological mechanisms of just, you know, being a person and to create options and prospects. And, and we need to, the public needs to choose. I mean, democracy, you know, this idea of, of a group handing us 
um, uh, options, and we and we're the ones who choose. We don't have options. For a long time, we didn't have options. We've been sold this idea that there's only one option, the military option. No diplomacy for so long. So we, we lost sight of it. We, we lost the ability to imagine it. Um, and I think it's false. Like you said, I really identify with, uh, with what you said. And I think that's the basic human condition. Then we need, we need leaders to not be a part of the same mechanism, but to show us different options. And regarding, you know, I, I thought about uh, what you said about fundamentalism. It's not, I think fundamentalism is a human condition. It's another mechanism. And it thrives in certain circumstances. And it, and it um, fizzles, fizzles in, in other. We have been feeding fundamentalism uh, in, in our region for a long time. We see it on the Jewish side as well. We see it in our government. We see it in the West Bank. Jewish fundamentalism. And, and we see it in, uh, with the Palestinians or in, the, in Islam. You know, it's all circumstances. It's, I, I'm willing to accept that not every tribe has the same set of values. But every person is uh, built similarly. We're not different internally. We're different culturally. We're, we're different in, 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 in what circumstances we were brought up in. We want different outcomes. We need different circumstances. That it's, it's very simple in my mind. It makes me think, um, again, I think there's you know, many people who could listen to this conversation and say that's, that's so naive. But first of all, I, I think you can't talk about naivete unless you come down to, to, the, to the details, you know, to, to the details of what working towards peace would mean. And I think that if we could even, we don't even have that conversation, because I think if we had that conversation, I can imagine some people, some leaders, like you say, rising above rising above that noise and saying for example we are going to work and do everything we can in order to build up in a potential partner a desire where and is a, where is our peace minister right where, there's no peace minister where are the resources going towards peace ever you're you're no longer doing the job you used to do does that affect your personal life we're very open in the house so they know everything they know father doesn't have a job a paying job he doesn't have a salary but he's busy <laughs> and he's doing work and I feel at least that they are proud of me and um, and that they and that they feel that uh, their father is invested in something. He's not just going to work, he's invested in something, which makes a difference. But yeah, I'm, I'm, the, the daily schedule is more uh, chaotic. Do you ever have thoughts of leaving, going somewhere else, you know, not, not having to fight for this place, for your for your mom's legacy, for, you know, for your kids to not have to be a part of this. Do these thoughts cross your mind? They do. But it's, um, it stays uh, theoretical. Because, I don't know, I, I, I feel kind of universalist. And this isn't particular. You know, Pain is everywhere. So I'll encounter a different kind of pain, and different kinds of injustice anywhere in the world. And this is where I was born. This is my language. This is my family and friends and culture. And so I need to cope with what is in front of me.
and to try and make it better. You know, I told my uh, partner before October 7th, I told her, what do you say? Let, uh, maybe we'll uh, go. Things are uh, not pleasant. <laughs> I said, you know, every, a lot of nations go through very dark times. And there are always people who go through those times. We are those people that don't leave and go through the dark times. I said, wow, that's a very interesting fatalist <laughs> perspective. Uh, but there's something romantic in it. <laughs> and after October 7th, and after we, Vivian was identified, I asked her, well, have we gotten to the red line? Is now the time uh, we live? She said, what are you talking about? We're going back to the kibbutz to rebuild. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say motivates you? What is the driving force that is keeping you going? Um, you know, these kinds of catastrophes, I think, create the possibility of change. They create movement. That's for sure. It's a, it's a certain thing. There is movement. You know, the status quo shattered. The Tonic uh, boards are uh, shifting. And um, I became driven to try and pull this movement into the change I want to see. And it brings me a sense of, I don't know, conviction and... Uh, and um, a mission. There's something to be done. So I'm, I'm doing it. Like my partner says, you have to, we, you know, we, you have to move the, the clothes from the machine to the dryer. <laughs> so I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Very simple missions. <laughs> <laughs> and do you feel the same sense of accomplishment with that as going to speak on an international panel? You did it. You put the clothes from the machine yeah. in the dryer. Yeah, it's pretty similar. You know, you have a box and you checked that mission. <laughs> you feel like you did something. You feel like you accomplished something. Like Maoz always says that hope is something you... Maoz Inon. Maoz Inon, who also lost his parents. Yeah, and we've, he says this thing about create. If hope is something you create. You know, I can imagine myself being very cynical about that before. And now I identify with it. It's it's true. I feel, you know, when I do something, I really feel I'm creating hope. And when I talk to officials, you know, representatives of states, sometimes I see like something flicker in their eyes that says that's an interesting perspective or that's an interesting idea that, that maybe has potential. So what do you think is... Um something you would ask the average Israeli, although there's nothing like an average Israeli to, to do right now, what do you think is the most important? It's hard for me to say, to tell others what to do. Um, because, I mean, nobody would have listened to me, right? If Vivian would have survived or if uh, we weren't living in Barry. So how can I tell anybody that doesn't have a stage to know this is what you need to do? Do whatever you can, you know. Do what you can. And also, you know, the, I didn't do anything since I was 20-something years old. So I, uh, it's not for me to say to others to do something. But if you have an idea... And if you have um, an outlet, and if you say, no, I can go to demonstrations, or I can arrange dialogue sessions in my workplace, I can do a podcast in, on political issues, I, be involved, be invested, be, you know, uh, take it into heart. 
Thank you so much for coming in and for speaking with me. And I'm um, very sorry for your loss. And I wish you a lot of luck and strength on your uh, mission to try to make things better for your children and for our country. Thank you. Thank you for listening. This has been Raw. To listen to more of our episodes, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you find your podcasts. I'm Anu Glory. Goodbye.